Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining today for our Stand and Street Shul Gala. We're going to begin momentarily, but at this time, we definitely need your help to kick things off and start off our gala this evening. In order to create a beautiful piece of art, we encourage your partici- participation right now and ask you just to think of a word that best represents the Stand and Street Shul. So all you have to do right at this time is just think of a word that best identifies or represents the Staten Street Shul. 
So when you think of the Sand and Street Shul, what do you think of? That's the question right now. And what we're going to do, we're going to provide a link in the chat, as you see right there. All you have to do is click on that link. You don't have to type, Sharon. Don't type anything in the chat. Just click on the link right there to menti.com. It brings up a little pop-up box. Right in that top pop-up box, go ahead and let us know a word that best represents the Stand and Street Shul. That's all you have to do. And again, Richard, there's no need to type anything in the chat itself. Just click on that link, and you're able to see on your screen right now some of the amazing words that are being used by all of you. So again, all you have to do is click on that link in the chat to menti.com. It brings up a little pop-up box, and we encourage all of you to contribute and participate in order to create this beautiful piece of art together. So again, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome and greatly appreciate you being here. Don't be shy, but all you have to do is click on that link to menti.com and incorporate some of the amazing words, very similar to what you see right now on your screen. About 15 participants so far have contributed, so we encourage all of the remaining participants to click on that link and join us, thinking of a word that again truly represents and identifies the Stand and Street Shul. Again, ladies and gentlemen, as you see on your screen, we encourage you to think of some words that best describe the Santa Street Shul to kick off our festivities. And at this time, I welcome your MC this evening. Let's give a great big round of applause to Shoshana at this time. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first and hopefully last Stanton Street Zoom Gala. I'm Shoshana Backrack. I am the wife of Liad Soller, and I'm also a member of this vibrant community. Um, at this time, I'm going to call Liad up. Do we lose? I'm going to come sit right here. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. You guys don't know who he is. <laughs> You're out of luck. <laughs> We're so glad to see everyone out there, and we look forward to having you back here in person for our next event. From the beautifully restored sanctuary of our 108 year old tenement shul on the Lower East Side to your living room, tonight we will celebrate survival, community, impactful leadership, and a brighter future. We have a great lineup in store for you. Um, there are gonna be times where you can just lean back and enjoy the show, and there will be other times we ask you to lean in and be a more active participant, like with the word cloud. And we'll keep everyone on mute for now, but please feel free to add to the chat whenever you feel the urge. And thank you for your contributions to the word cloud. Um, from what I saw, it looks like a number of people think of community when they think of Stanton, and I do too. Uh, so to begin, please welcome and sing along with the very talented Laura Weisblatt, who also happens to be the former president of our shul. She's going to be singing Hatikva. Hi, Stanton Street community. My name is Laura Weisblatt. I am a proud former member and board member of the Stanton Street Shul. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to um, join the event tonight with my voice and sing um, my personal rendition of Hatikva, uh, accompanied by myself on the keyboard. And um, my husband and I lived for many years on the Lower East Side and we're very proud members and board members of the Stanton Street Shul. Um, we miss the community deeply and send our love and best wishes to all of you. And um, 
you know, are just so thrilled to see the community still thriving and um, doing so well, even during these times. Sending all our love, and here is Hatikva. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura, that was beautiful. So now we would like you to please consider making an additional donation tonight to help our shul thrive in the coming year. If we raise $5,000 during the Scala, an anonymous donor will contribute an additional 2,500 above and beyond their original generous gift. If you are able, please text to the number 44321. In the message, write Stanton Gala, just one word, and you will be taken to a donation page. We'll be flashing to this information a couple more times this evening. Um, and now allow me to introduce the Stanton Street School president and Leon and I's very first friend here at Stanton, Jeff Katz, who will deliver the state of the school address. Dear friends, Thank you for being part of the Stanton Street Shul's annual gala, brought to you this year via Zoom. Your participation and generous, generous support is very much appreciated. I am Jeff Katz, and as president of this amazing synagogue, it is my distinct pleasure to offer a State of the Shul address. First, let me say, Ze hayom asa Hashem nagila v'nismechavo. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In addition, I want to thank the tireless and creative work of the gala planning committee, including Jill Slater, Margie Siegel, Barry Feldman, and Scott at the, extreme, at the Extreme Event Group. I send a special Mazal Tov to my friend Alvin Goldstein on receiving this year's Community Service Award for his years of invaluable service and for being a most faithful Minion regular. And I warmly thank our essential workers who sustained us throughout a painful pandemic. I've had the privilege to serve our congregation as president, as chair of the Rabbinic Search and Advisory Committee, and by overseeing the restoration and renovation of this shul. Over this time, I've gained a realistic perspective on the state of the Stanton Street Shul. We have defied all the odds, and after 108 years, we are still a vibrant and magnetic shul, especially now that we have Rabbi Liad Staller as our full-time Rabbi, after a very difficult and dangerous year in which we remained highly cautious yet equally optimistic, we are now entering a much more promising time as the pandemic is easing and members and friends, thank God, are returning to shul. With their return, we rely on the fundamental be bedrock of our shul, our people. For together, we are guided by our principled mission statement, our commitment to shared team governance, our volunteers and committees, and strong rabbinic leadership. Attendance at Shabbat services has been growing, kiddishes and dinners are back, Torah learning has expanded, and the sound of Stanton kids can be heard once again. Our hope is that many new members, committed daveners, avid Torah seekers, and generous financial supporters will guarantee our future. 
Over the past three years, we remarkably transformed a decaying, ne neglected, century-old building with great history and enormous personality into a jewel box on the historic Lower East Side. By wisely utilizing the enormously generous contributions donated by our collective Stanton family. We should all feel great pride in this enormous accomplishment. Yet while we were in the final stages of the, of the renovation, two events greatly challenged us. In March of 2019, our rabbi of four years announced he would be leaving Stanton Street. And a year later, in March of 2020, we were all impacted and horrified by the COVID pandemic. In response to our first challenge, we formed a rabbinic search committee, formulated our goals and objectives, and circulated our job description and awaited responses. In the interim, the internal talent within and from without our community was energized, and we produced classes, trashot, and services that propelled us forward. Even though we did beautifully and continue to serve the needs of our community, we, therefore, we needed to understand that we were, could not continue as a lay-led congregation. It was unsustainable. Today's celebration salutes the many who carried the ball for all those months. But after one year, we were without the right candidate, and the Stanton Street Shul was not going to settle for anyone but the best. And then last June, 15 months since we began our search, and four months into the worst collective health crisis in our lives, I received an unparalleled resume by a man named Liad Stala, a rabbi in his 20s, who had accumulated awards, relevant experience, fellowships, and a number of prestigious degrees. Rabbi Stala's resume was a showstopper, but his accompanying cover letter surprised us even more. It expressed all the points we as a committee were so committed in finding in a new rabbi. Here was a candidate who was committed to Jewish learning with strong intellectual rigor and in carrying a relevant moral and contemporary message in his sermons and classes. Liad understood that Stanton Street was not your cookie-cutter congregation. He seemed committed to LGBT inclusion in advancing women's participation within halakha, in expanding Stanton kids, Stanton kids programming, and in bringing strong Jewish learning to a broad spectrum of people with and without formal Jewish education. There was a sharp debate whether it was financially prudent and even fair to hire a rabbi during such unprecedented times. Some said it was a huge, crazy step but in fact, it was totally in the Stanton tradition. I am sure Liad will look back one day and marvel at the chutzpah Stanton had in hiring him during these tumultuous times. But we had no alternative. After a long search, we found the right guy for the right job. We had to move forward and seize the opportunity. Within a few weeks, the contract was signed, and we have never questioned our decision. For we have been blessed with Liad's inspiring drashot, shiurim, and acts of chesed. Now, after nine months, Liad is being officially installed as the rabbi of the Stanton Street Shul. He and Shoshana, with their youthful energy and professional skills, have quickly realized what he wrote in his cover letter, and I quote, we dream of the prospect of establishing our family and future in this broad, diverse, and lively Jewish community. Rabbi, you have found a warm, embracing, seriously committed community that is thirsty for your Torah, your enthusiasm, your generosity and compassion, all of which we were hoping to find in a Stanton rabbi. You and Shoshana are the future that will continue to propel our 108-year-old shul forward. May God bless Rabbi and Shoshana Stala with years of Stanton success and happiness. May God bless Alvin Goldstein for his invaluable service to our community. May God bless our essential workers for their commitment and sacrifice. And may God bless the Stanton Street Shul, you, its members and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our shul is full of talented artists, as well as amazing lay leaders and teachers. 
Here is a quick montage of the show, Stanton at its best, that was installed just in time for the lockdown and has remained on view in our balcony, and we hope you'll be able to see it in person soon. Months before Rabbi Liad and Shoshana arrived, I spent the Sunday morning with former rabbinic couple at Stanton Street, Rabbi Aviad and Lindsay. And Aviad said to me that morning, I never thought that my successor would have a harder time at Stanton Street than I did when I arrived. I thought I'd got everything ready for a successor to make it easier. And then along came the pandemic. But it's so strange to think that it's been under a year and just in that short amount of time Rabbi Liad and Shoshana, two Talmidei Chachamim whose wisdom in Torah is matched by their wisdom and loveliness and kindness in life have just brought so much energy to this little corner of downtown. They completely get the Stanton Street vibe. Stanton completely gets them. Corinne and I are just so happy to be friends with them and to be friends with the community at this time. Joe, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, our, um, the Lower East Side urban historian, Barry Feldman, he will now walk us through the history of Stanton Street Shul's congregation and building as we watch a before and after montage of images of our historic shul. Think about this, in 1913, how often did a Jew from Jassy, Romania, enjoy coffee at a street cafe in Warsaw? Or how many Jews from icy St. Petersburg enjoyed winters in milder Odessa? Answer, infrequently, closer to almost never. That is what is so interesting about the Lower East Side. 1913, a year in the iconic period of Jewish settlement on the Lower East Side a vibrant mix of Jews from Russia, Poland, Austria, Romania, Hungary, Turkey, even Yugoslavia, lived in close proximity, interacting, shopping, working side by side, marrying even. The streets east of Essex between Houston and Delancey were favored by Galician Jews from Austria, Hungary. This was Brezhizhen territory. 1913. Jews from the Galician town of Brezhizhan, with the leadership of Rabbi Judah Loeb, built B'nai Jacob Anshi Brezhizhan, sons of Jacob, people of Brezhizhan, the synagogue, the shul we are celebrating tonight. The synagogue's origins are earlier. Immigrants from Brezhizhan organized a Lanzmannschaft, a benevolent and social organization dedicated to helping newly arrived former neighbors and friends. Ten years later, they established a synagogue on the Galician patch of the Lower East Side. Stanton Street is a tenement shul, referring to the physical dimensions of the building, about 100 feet long by 20 feet wide. Tenement also evokes the built environment of the Lower East Side, but also suggests images of slum, slum Poor, crowded, poorly ventilated spaces. In fact, the synagogue was well lit, welcoming, ventilated, inclusive, and friendly. The Constitution assured that all were welcome. Assistance was offered to the sick, unemployed, and mourners were attended to, just as it is today. 
Since 1913, Stanton Street has experienced ups and downs. Lower East Side Jews looked to greater New York. Harlem, Brooklyn, and the Bronx offered improved housing and employment opportunities. After many years of leadership under Rabbi Joseph Singer, membership declined and the building succumbed to age. The foundation was compromised, water oozed through the common walls, floorboards cracked. Once again, our Stanton Street Shul rallied. rallied. We looked to the past for inspiration and the future for encouragement. The congregation, inspired by rabbinic leadership, increased. Two years ago, the shul was restored with a paint job, widened pews, a new paroled and modified mechitza curtain. 1913 has moved into the 21st century. We have much to celebrate today. Rabbi Stoller has joined us and energized board of trustees continues to consider options that will enhance the synagogue. Congregants are returning after the pandemic, pandemic hiatus. If you haven't been at Stanton for a while, we look forward to seeing you soon. If you've never been, we invite you to join our historic congregation. Thank you, Barry. Next, we would like to honor someone in our community very dear to us, Alvin Goldstein. Alvin, Liad still cherishes the sweet advice that you gave to him when he first called to introduce himself to you. I'd like to introduce Peretz Burke, who will present our Community Service Award to Alvin. It is my honor and privilege to present this award to my friend Alvin Goldstein. The Mishnah in Avo speaks of three foundational principles, Torah, Jewish learning, Avoda, prayer, and Gemilas Chasadim, acts of kindness. Torah. Alvin is a stalwart of Torah classes at the Stanton Street Shul. Avoda, Tzvila, Davening. Alvin is vital to our minion. I know he's often one of the first 10 that make our minion at the Stanton Street Shul. I wouldn't know this as an eyewitness, but we have the policy of giving an aliyah to the first 10 that make the minion. And it seems that every week, Alvin is getting an aliyah. During COVID, in the cold of winter, when we kept our doors and windows wide open for maximum air circulation, Alvin was here with us, teeth chattering and making our minion. Gambilas Chasadim. Alvin's career as a social worker was with the New York City Department of Homeless Services, taking care of the neediest and most vulnerable in our society. He has also served for many years on the Shul's board where he is sagacious counsel and kind and warm manner is always valued. For years, our kiddishes and dinners were catered with the help of Alvin, regularly driving and schlepping to Costco for food and supplies to stock our kitchen. Alvin is a most generous supporter of the shul. Today, we not only thank you, honor, and salute you with this community service award for all that you do to make our special shul flourish, we also express our deep appreciation for your humility and for being an exceptional role model for all of us. Thank you. Presented to Alvin Goldstein, Zoom Gala, Community Service Honoree for his unequal dedication to the Stanton Street Shul, 26 Divan, 5781, June 6, 2021. Thank you, Peretz, and thank you, Stanton Street, for this wonderful award. Mazel Tov, Rabbi, for your installation. Thank you to all who put in time and effort for this day and other times allowing us to survive and thrive. I am grateful for the statement, all are welcome, all will feel welcome, which I have found to be very true. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Peretz, and a special and most appreciative thank you to Alvin. May we share many more years together at the Stanton Street Tool. So this brings us to the hands-on part of the evening. 
um, and the Stanton Street Krupnik. I don't know what a Krupnik is, but we're gonna find out. <laughs> so David Deitch, uh, take it away. <laughs> I think we're good. All right, little technical difficulty here, uh, but we will resolve it. All right, so I was asked to make something for the uh, the shoal for people to drink. And I, I thought given the shoal's uh, origins in Eastern Poland, I'd, uh, I'd make some Krupnik. All right, Krupnik, for those who are unaware, is a, a Polish honey liqueur. Now, in Poland before World War I and to a great extent before World War II, the, the main distillers were Jews. So Jews weren't necessarily Kruptik makers, but uh, they surely made the vodka. And then Poles uh, for festivities would take the vodka. Um, I use for this a Polish vodka, um, vodka brand vodka. To both, uh, so I should tell people not a, not a liquor snob. Um, it's incredibly cheap, pretty tasty. Um, I can confirm. <laughs> but so you want uh, two cups of this. Okay. Put in a little uh, bowl there. Now you're going to want six teaspoons of honey. So, you know, to make sure the honey gets mixed in well, put a little bit in there too to mix that up. All right, pour that in with the vodka. All right, very good. Uh, you want um, a cinnamon stick. So, if you got a skinny cinnamon stick, maybe about two thirds of a stick. We got a nice fat piece like this, half of it. We'll go with a fat piece. Um, 15 cloves, throw those in. Uh, and an orange peel. And if, if, if you got one of these fancy things here, right, then you, you can right, peel the, uh, the orange in this nice little fancy thing here. Otherwise, just slice it up into little pieces and throw it in there and throw it in the pot. Now, um, as I told some people, uh, if you have a, uh, well, let me say this, the, the traditional way of making Krupnik back in Poland, um, Poles would invite their, uh, their neighbors over. They'd mix all this together. Krupnik is basically just honey, vodka, and whatever spices you want to throw in. You want lemon peel, lemon peel. You want anise, anise, nutmeg, you name it, whatever you want. This is just sort of something I threw together. But they throw it all together. They form a circle. They light it on fire. Um, and uh, then when uh, it all ignited, they all blow it out together and then they drink it hot. Um, popular in Northeastern Poland, a little north of Brzezhan, Belarus, uh, Lithuania, um, and uh, interesting enough, Karaites, for those who know who those are, uh, also apparently were big Krupnik drinkers. They lived in Troki, which is up, up near Lithuania. Um, so we, uh, we don't have a lot of Polish friends, so <laughs> we're just going to cook it on our stove here, but uh, there will at some point uh, be, be fire when the, when the flames ignite. So I have a wet towel, have uh, this to tamp it down, so we're being very careful and safe. Uh, and while that's happening, um, let's see, can we, yeah, right, we want to get that in there because, you know, that's the uh, first shot. I'm also going to put together another drink. While we're waiting for that to ignite. Um, so today is June 6th. It is the anniversary of the Normandy invasion. So I, I made a cocktail uh, in honor of that. Um, you, uh, you salt the rim of a glass. You mix in here for the British, one ounce of lime juice. For the Canadians, uh, who were again, one of the three armies at Normandy, half an ounce of maple syrup. For the Americans, I go with a, a rye heavy bourbon. I prefer Wild Turkey 101 uh, in honor of the 101st Airborne Division, which was, of course, at Normandy. Throw that in with some ice. Shake it up. Put two ounces of seltzer in the salted glass. That represents the English Channel. And uh, now the Allied military has crossed the channel. And I, uh, I call that the Allied landing. So we'll be drinking this while we wait for the, uh, the Krupka to ignite. 
Krupnik, sorry, Krupnik doing that. Um, fun little fact, the, uh, the first time I went to my, my prospective uh, wife's parents' house for Shabbos dinner, um, they, they put out a bottle of wine, Mechayim, which I proceeded to drink because that's what was out. And then afterwards, Aliza's uh, mother took her aside and said, um, at least you can tell me, does, does David have a drinking problem? Um, and of course, I, I laugh about this and think, oh, that's, that's so ridiculous. But then there's moments where I think, as soon as they wanted somebody to make cocktails for the show, they called on me. And I'm actually making a cocktail within the process of making another cocktail. So I, I guess perhaps Elise's mother was uh, more intuitive than I thought. But um, we'll see. Hopefully this will, uh, this will boil and ignite soon, and we'll see what happens. Um, and again, make sure that uh, you know you, you have your you know various things ready uh, at home should a fire ignite here. Um, the uh, no, all, all the messages there. Um, sorry, <laughs> very distracting. Um, so uh, again, in terms of Jews and alcohol in Eastern Europe, um, yeah, thank you, Margie. We're um, to see it ignite. What? We're coming closer to see it ignite. Okay, I'm hoping, I'm hoping. Uh, theoretically, that is how it should work. It boils, it goes. Uh, one, watch the pot. Yeah, but right, I'm not gonna look at the pot. Nobody watched the pot. Thank you, Lisa. Um, <laughs> distilling was one of these specific things that Jews were granted in charters when they moved to Poland in the late Middle Ages. Um, it was a major source of revenue, certainly for them, but also for the Polish landlords um, who's, uh, who's um, who gave them, you know, sort of contracts to run inns and taverns and so forth. Uh, and again, this was the case in the late 19th century in the Russian Empire sort of trying to create national monopolies on vodka production in order to both generate revenue, but also to theoretically eliminate the, uh, the, the negative influence the Jews had on the peasants. Um, and then obviously Jewish distilling sort of disappeared after World War II or before World War II. Um, but, but one of the funny things is that after Poland uh, left the Warsaw Pact and began to open up again. They developed this kind of nostalgia for the good old days and Polish Jewish vodka and the notion that back in the older days, the Jews made the good stuff. Um, and so you, you actually have, in, in, not this certainly, but in Poland, a number of vodkas which are uh, sort of designed to evoke uh, you know, the, the olden days, right? Queen Esther vodka and Purim vodka and so forth all designed to, you know, capture the moment when, you know, the, the Jews made the good vodka. Oh, here, we're getting closer here. Um, so starting to boil, which hopefully means that uh, it should soon be starting to ignite as well. I don't want to step on the toes, but I just want to say that one of the very first outings I had when I got to Stanton, like my second week at the show, was David offering to take me to the liquor store next to Costco. <laughs> so this is a very fitting induction into the Stanton family. Started with David's alcohol expertise and it's concluding with it. <laughs> oh, hopefully not concluding. Well, um, not concluding, inducting. Yeah. Well, we'll see, we'll see if this thing ignites. So again. Yeah, it depends on the fire. <laughs> well, it's gonna be very disappointing if it does. It certainly has always ignited before. Um, so, you know. Not sure at what point in the process, but we'll give it another minute and see what happens. And if not, <laughs> if, if not, then I guess uh, you can always just, you know, light it up yourself at home. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think it would be wrong for me to make it more dangerous by, you know, choosing to ignite it, but. We take no legal liability yeah, for what's about to occur. <laughs> oh, see, this is this is the way uh, the way things always work here, right? That as soon as you uh, as soon as you call attention to it, right? Say, mommy, mommy, look, look, I'm making fire, right? Then it doesn't burn. I'm knowing it, just I'm, uh, ripped by the boiling pot. Yeah. Well, we got the boiling going, and again, normally this would also be the uh, the point where it ignites. But you know what? It's not going to ignite. It's not going to ignite. Um, who am I to argue with, uh, with chemistry? So, uh, whenever it ignites, or if it doesn't ignite, whenever you feel that it is uh, sufficiently boiled, and you know whatever point you're making has been made, 
Uh, I apologize for those who only signed up for the pyrotechnics. Um, <laughs> but take it, pour it in a jar. You know, again, back in Poland, they would uh, drink it directly, you know, which again, you can drink it hot if you want to. Um, I, I, I like it cold. Um, you let it sit for two and a half hours, right? So let this steep for two and a half hours. After two and a half hours, you fish out the, uh, the various things that are inside it. Um, when it settles, it'll be kind of clear, but if you shake it up, um, you get a kind of nice orange color. Um, my personal recommendation is to serve it in a uh, repurposed yardside candle glass, which is, I think, the finest whiskey glass as possible. And uh, bottoms up, l'chaim, l'zdrovia. L'chaim, l'chaim. And great job. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. <laughs> you, that was fantastic. Hi, Rabbi and Shoshana. Happy installation. But you don't need to be installed. You're not an air conditioner. You two just naturally fit in. New York and specifically Stanton Street Shul are where those who are different come to fit in. You two are so positive and enthusiastic, it's almost hard to believe you're Jewish. You're wonderful. Stanton Street Shul is lucky to have you. And God willing, you'll both do amazing things to help us grow spiritually and to make all the new people you'll attract feel as welcome as the congregation does now. Mazel tov to us all. Thanks so much, Dana. That was so nice. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody cooked a cocktail along with David, but if you are, hope, if you did, hopefully you are safe and not on fire right now. And you're just sipping your thematic and slightly perilous cocktail. So while we enjoy our cocktails, imaginary or real, here is some visual fodder to enhance your party mood. Last year, the Stanton Street Shul deigned to have their pre per masquerade ball on the cusp of a worldwide shutdown. Leon and I were in Israel, but we are jealous that we missed it. Enjoy the photos. Now we are honored and privileged to welcome Rav Moshe Lichtenstein, who will deliver an introductory Dvar Torah. Rav Lichtenstein is the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshivat Haratzion, where Liad learned for two years. He is the inheritor of a prominent modern Orthodox legacy, and he is a Rebbe and role model to Liad. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel very much a guest. Uh, I don't know anyone of 
the people personally, besides, of course, for Rev. Uh, Yad and Shoshana, but I feel extremely uh, overwhelmed by emotion. Uh, it's a tremendous privilege for me to view Liad uh, settling down into the show. And uh, I think for the show, it's a wonderful opportunity to get a, a young, bright, uh, energetic Talmud Chacham. I'd like to say a few words about uh, the Kriyat Torah, the portions of the Torah that we've been reading in the past uh, few weeks. Sefer Bamidbar deals a lot with issues of leadership. If we go back, not to yesterday, but a week before yesterday, there's a major crisis of leadership. B'nai Yisrael complain, the Jews have trouble in... Uh, the Jews have trouble uh, in the desert, they're bored, the food is not to their liking. Uh, and uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses is ready to give up. He actually offers his resignation. He tells the Kadosh Baruch Hu that he has no more strength to continue. Uh, unlike Netanyahu, he really wants to leave and to resign. He's frustrated. And then this is very enigmatic. And then God steps in, gives him 70 assistants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a very enigmatic portion there about two figures, Eldad Umeidad. And the Torah tells us that Eldad and Meidad remain within the camp and they prophesize. The Torah doesn't tell us what they say, it does record the response of Joshua. Yeshua ben Nun, he says that Moses should lock them up. And Moshe refuses. What were they saying? What was the issue at stake over there? The, the, the Gemara, the Talmud tells us that uh, the prophecy was that Moshe Rabbeinu would remain, would die in the desert, in the wilderness, and Joshua would, would lead them into Eretz Israel, into the promised land. Why did they know that? What did they observe? And of that told them that this would be the scenario that, we, that would unfold. It seems to me what they saw was a, a generational issue. They thought that the new generation, a generation moving into the new land, would need a leader from a younger generation. That Moshe Rabbeinu was the leader who was perfectly suited for Egypt, for receiving the Torah on Har Sinai, on, on Mount Sinai. But for the next stage, because of reasons that I lack the time now to explain, they would need to transition to younger and more youthful leadership. And paradoxically, Yoshua, the person who wants to lock them up, is the one who actually do that. And we, of course, know that after 40 years in the desert, when the new generation enters the land, Joshua indeed is the one who, who leads them into the land. And that uh, the transition between, uh, from the wilderness to Eretz Israel is also a transition in leadership. Uh, and that the younger generation, those who were not in Egypt, needed indeed a new leader. Now, if I ask a bit more what was really going on, I think part of the issue was that uh, Sure, I mean, what Moses saw was the people were basically uh, too materialistic. All they wanted there was to seek uh, fancy food for them, watermelons and, uh, and cucumbers and things like that, which in the desert indeed is a delicacy. Uh, and uh, Moshe Benu basically gave up being able, his message was one of struggle, of resistance, of uh, fighting the Egyptians. Uh, and when Israel, be, when the Israelites became softer, so to speak, and became much more interested in the material comforts, he lacked the tools and the message to be able to address their situation. And, uh, and therefore, of course, he had the, there's a crisis that we read yesterday, the spies, and eventually Moshe will pass on the scene and Joshua will take over his place. It seems to me uh, that um, it's very fitting, I think, for uh, with the installation that we are uh, having tonight. Uh, I, I think really Rev. Liad is a wonderful uh, young rabbinic leader. And I, I know him from, uh, from the time basically came to Yeshiva at the age of 18, 19. Uh, 
and watch his growth. Um, he's both knowledgeable and flexible, and um, his flexibility and his and his knowledge and his energy uh, are exactly what's needed. I, I, my, what I understand the little I saw here during the evening, uh, aside from the whiskey, was uh, basically the transitional stage in the show itself. So renovated. The show is transitioning from an older generation to a, to a younger generation, in, in, certainly in part. Uh, I hope I'm not mistaken on that, but uh, whatever, it, what certainly is true is that a, a young, energetic leader will uh, take the show, I think, to the next uh, stage and will be able, and it's probably suited now for contemporary times. And I say, particularly in downtown Manhattan, at uh, the, the Lower East Side, I remember my childhood going to buy uh, a Louvre and Estrog is probably not the Lower East Side uh, of today. And uh, I assume the congregants are, are different congregants. And leaving a shul in Manhattan, which has this fair amount of material culture, uh, he certainly acquires the skills of a Yeshua. And uh, I really believe that the Rev Liad, the together with Shoshana, be able to provide wonderful leadership uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing many uh, positive reports and to continue to observe his growth and development uh, and um, I really wish the show uh, the best in the in really enjoying I agree with everything I was said at the beginning about the choice of the rabbi and uh, how is it such a natural choice I'll just add a final point though Bezrat Hashem, I hope that not everyone is satisfied all the time. Already Chazal, the, the rabbis tell us about Mordechai that if you satisfy everybody all the time, you're not doing your job. And the, the role of a spiritual leader is to basically to set goals, which are not where the community is, it's to, it's to set goals to further the community. It's to put a, a signpost a mile or two ahead of where the community is at the moment. So the community should seek to arrive at that point and then to move the goalposts and to uh, take the community another mile or two uh, forward. And um, there's always a built-in tension between a leader trying to lead and those who follow. And Chazal tell us you can, you should hopefully satisfy most people, but you can never please everybody, especially when people are, human nature is human nature, and people are different. So, I, uh, I give him a bracha that he sh and I give the shul a bracha that he should please most. He should please most of the people most of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. If he's pleasing everybody, if, if we're pleasing all the people all the time, apparently he will not be doing his job. But if we're pleasing most of the people most of the time, I'm convinced he'll be doing his job the way it should be done. Mazal tov, yishar koach, yiratzon shetelech, michayu lechayu leorech yamim tovim. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rebbe. Thank you. So we're now going to break into groups for some social interaction beyond your pod. No one is going to be in the main room. Leon and I are going to jump around to the randomly created groups and you will have five minutes to discuss the silver lining of your COVID era life. Make sure everyone in your group gets a chance to speak and we'll return here in five minutes.
Scott or whoever is here, can you put us into another breakout room now? Uh, sure. Which room do you want to go to? Anyone? If you have a minute left, uh, yeah. yep. Give me one second. Oh, we only have a minute. Uh, it actually, I it won't. I can't assign you to another room. All right. Oh, all right. Try to pop into another okay. one. We weren't able to. Okay. Fine. We're doing good. Thank you. You're doing a great uh, job. No, thank you. Uh, you have uh, about a, a minute left. Everyone's gonna automatically pop in. Just give everyone some time, uh, so they get like resettled. Everyone's gonna still be muted, and then uh, ultimately. Um, all right. Yeah. You, you continue yeah, from there. I was gonna say. I mean, Stanton is part of my silver lining as well, but. I think my real so uh, my real silver lining is not having to go to court in prison. Yeah, that's true. That's pretty. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> and getting a puppy. It, well, that wasn't doesn't have to do with with us uh, COVID. Well, that's no? true. That's true. That's more, you know. Do you want to read through some of the comments that were left for you, Leah? Sure. I don't think I got the number for me. <laughs> yeah, call me if you send them to me. Yeah. Oh, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> all right. Scott, are we all back? You, uh, I would give about another 15 seconds, but you're good to go. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the breakout rooms that we weren't able to get to. We'll just share our silver linings now. Liad's silver lining is that we, well, Liad was hired here and we get to share community with you. I'm not going to lie. My silver lining is that I get to go to court, um, in my apartment online. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's pretty great. <laughs> All right. So Scott, if you just give me a heads up when we can move on. You're good to go. Okay. So our Stanton Kids program has continued to grow as our community of families grows. We are so happy to have had Aliza Deitch and Leslie Levinson leading online classes and are so grateful for an in-person kids gathering for Shavuot across the street at our local community garden. Thank you to Elizabeth Miller for programming all these great events. We anticipate much more singing, snacking, and playing together while learning and celebrating our Jewish holidays in the coming year. And just a shout out to the Stanton kids that are always in shul, uh, Mika and Tall and Slater. We love you guys and we love seeing you in shul. Andy Warhol, Heinz Ketchup, Shoshana Bacharach Stoller. Do you have any idea what that connection is? If you guess that they are all associated with Pittsburgh, you would be correct. Bruce Springsteen, Bon Jovi, Rabbi Liad Stoller. Do you have the connection? If you guessed the Jersey Shore, again, you would be correct. Scholarship, enthusiasm, chesed. These three things are deeply connected with the Stollers. They embody everything that any shul could ask for in a rabbinic family. We are so happy to have you. Mazel tov and welcome to our community. Thank you so much, Margie, especially for comparing Liat to Bon Jovi. That's a really <laughs> great compliment. <laughs> so now we will turn to Rabbi Baruch Simon, who will be sharing a blessing or a bracha. Rabbi Baruch Simon is a Rosh Yeshiva at Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary, where Liad received his rabbinic ordination. He is a member of the extended Lower East Side family, an influential teacher of Jewish law, 
and a halachic guide and mentor to both Rabbi Liad and myself. Bishus the Kehila of the Stanton Street Shul. I want to express the very bracha to my Talmud, Rabbi Liad Stahler, and the Rebetzin Shoshana upon their installation as the Rav and Rebetzin of the Shul. These individuals are people of tremendous scholarship, tremendous Torah knowledge, but together with that is a special sensitivity that they have towards people, Ben Adam Lachavero as well, and understand the needs of the people in their shul and in the community at large. They're people who have proper respect for all Torah scholars throughout the community, but understand the needs of different types of people in the community and understand sensitivities. And Be'ez Hashem, I wish them a tremendous hatzlacha and good health and being able to bring their community, their own shul, to the highest heights that they can as part of the, the general community as well in the Lower East Side. It was a wonderful community, a wonderful opportunity. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give them Baracha v'Hatzlacha to continue for many years to come to be pillars of the community of the, and bring a Kiddush Hashem to the community, their shul, and the whole community as well. I wish them Baracha v'Hatzlacha b'chol Masi Yudeichem. Thank you, Rabbi Simon. We are grateful to have been able to continue our spiritual practices, davening, and holiday observances during some of the very challenging times, both in shul and via Zoom. Thank you to our millionaires who kept our online and in-person davening intact during these hard times. Thank you to those who showed up for Shabbat morning services once our shul was open, and a special thank you to Jeff and Mordechai for leading services and reading Torah every week. The women's tefillah group celebrated Rosh Chodesh monthly via Zoom, and a special thank you to Rachel Mincer for coordinating that effort. Thank you to all of those who hosted Havdalah services from your homes or sang along to our Zoom Kabbalat Shabbat, Kabbalat Shabbat services. It takes a village, and luckily we have one that is very committed. <laughs> Rabbi Stoller, congratulations. Congratulations on your installation as the rabbi of the Stan Street Shul. And congratulations on you and Shoshana continuing to join us here in the downtown, downtown Jewish community. We deeply appreciate and treasure your contributions and your presence here. It is, of course, your patience that is so precious. It is, of course, your insights your insights into uh, something like 3,000 years worth of Jewish knowledge is deeply, deeply impressive. Your extreme honesty, your honesty even when you might not know something or you actually made a mistake, misquoted something, your honesty. That honesty is so crucial to us learning with you. Your sense of humor in dealing with us and also even the humor that you find in Torah and Tanakh and in Gomorrah. It's your intellectual honesty, though, that really is, is, is stirring. Your honesty and curiosity 
in all aspects of life. You are deeply precious to us and we are so, so happy to have both of you here in our community. Congratulations again. Mazel tov. Thank you, Richard. Now I would like to ask everyone to please rise and grab a noisemaker, maybe a pot and a wooden spoon or a drum, a cowbell, or you can just clap your hands for we are going to recreate together those bittersweet moments New Yorkers set aside time for every night for months and months during the COVID peak to celebrate and shower gratitude upon our city's essential workers. We made it through some very tough times together and it is important for us to stop and recognize that as a community. We'll be spotlighting all of you one at a time, so be ready for your cameo. Start spreading the news. I'm leaving today I want to be a part of it New York, New York These vagabond shoes Are longing to stray Right through the very heart of it New York city that doesn't sleep and find I'm king of the hill top of the heap these little town blues are melting away I'll make a brand new start of it in old If I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere. It's up to you, New York, New York. Hi, it's Kressel. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Rabbi Stoller, for helping me find my new spiritual home. It's wonderful to have a young rabbi who understands so well about civil rights, about how Yidin should interact with our neighbors, and I look forward to being part of this kahila for a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kressel. During the past year plus of pandemic life, the Stanton Street Shul has been fortunate to have so many talented educators in its midst. These wonderful teachers availed themselves to bring incredible ideas to our homes via Zoom. They fomented rich spiritual and intellectual conversations and helped sew back our fractured and isolated community. And to them, we are so grateful. Aliza Deitch, <laughs> David Deitch, Hello again. Rachel Frazier, Michelle Friedman, Eliev Grossman, Dove Lurla, Zachary Levine, Leslie Levinson, Richard McBee, hello, Sandra Rappaport, Diane Reich, Jeremy Tibbetts, David Wander, Rabbi Joe, oh, <laughs> Rabbi Joe Wolfson, Nancy Wolfson Moshe, and Liad Stoller.
Who would have known that the COVID pandemic would have a silver lining for the Stanton Street Show? Times were dark on the Lower East Side as the pandemic raged. But then, Liat and Shoshana came to Stanton Street. And with their presence, our community began to brighten. Even though we weren't yet back in our building, thanks to Zoom and the Stallers, we connected through Shiorim, cooking classes, and the occasional celebration in their courtyard. Phyllis and I would like to present our rabbinic couple with a certificate of appreciation. This is the Silver Lining Award presented to Liad Stoller and Shoshana Bakrak in recognition of their work bringing sunshine to the Stanton Street Shul in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. May we continue to go from strength to strength, continuing to learn and celebrate and grow together for many years to come. Mazal Tov, Liad and Shoshana. Mazal Tov, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you guys so much. We're gonna hang that up in our apartment. Um, I'm now privileged to introduce Rabbi Schachter. He is a professor of Jewish history and Jewish thought at Yeshiva University and a senior scholar at the Center for Jewish Future. He is a mentor to hundreds of rabbis worldwide and is a close personal mentor to Rabbi Liad and myself. We are forever grateful to his advice to us to spend the year in Jerusalem in addition to all of his guidance. I want to thank you, Shoshana, very much for that uh, very gracious introduction. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to let all of you know what kind of an incredible honor it is and a privilege uh, for me to be able to participate in this uh, extraordinary event uh, in the history of your congregation uh, as you welcome an exceptional, uh, gifted uh, rabbinic couple, uh, Rabbi Liad Stahler and uh, Shoshana. Uh, I've known Rabbi Stoller now for a number of years as a student of mine in a group that I uh, run at uh, REITS at the Yeshiva University. Um, you have uh, heard about that. And uh, to have the uh, chance to welcome him into the official world of the uh, American Orthodox Rabbinate is uh, an exceptional thrill uh, for me. Um, I want to let you know something that you obviously already know by now. Uh, uh, Rabbi Liad and Shoshana have been with you for a while, uh, so you have gotten to know them and know them well, and I'm sure to have benefited greatly from their contributions to your uh, exceptional uh, congregation and, and synagogue. But I want to tell you from where I sit, uh, I find uh, that this couple is uh, exceptional and, and extraordinary. And uh, Rabbi Stahler uh, is very much uh, devoted to following the footsteps of uh, other rabbis who have served your congregation with uh, distinction and with rabbis in general. Um, this coming week's uh, Torah portion has the word Uri Isem twice. Uh, it has the word Uri Isem uh, at the beginning, uh, Uri Isem es Haaretz Mahi, and you shall see uh, the land as the scouts or the spies were being sent out with a message, see the land, mahi. At the very end, in the section of tzitzit, and uh, there is a tradition that we make a big deal about the words that appear in the Torah, and it's been pointed out that the word uri'item, or particularly uri'iten, uh, appears three times, twice in this week's parasha, once at the beginning of the book of Exodus, talking about the midwives when the Jewish people were going to give birth uh, in uh, Egypt, they were given a mandate to and you will see these little children, these babies as they're born on the birth stool. And I would like to point out in honor of our illustrious, uh, exceptional, distinguished, and wonderful guests of honor, new Rabbi Rebetzin of your congregation, that uh, Rabbi Liad and Shoshana uh, represent all three of these uh, in the best way for the Jewish people, and in particular, uh, the blessing that you have that they are uh, Rabbi Liad and Shoshana part of and leaders of your, of your community. Uritem oto uzachartem et kol mitzvot Hashem. 
is Jewish tradition. We look at, we focus, we build upon the mitzvot on our commitment to an observant way of life, to following a set of rules, to uh, appreciating uh, the nature of, uh, of our relationship to God. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, Parsha, Ritemet Haaretz, Haaretz is the land of Israel, which I interpret as the destiny of the Jewish people. It's not so much the responsibilities, the technical uh, mitzvot responsibilities, but it's the drama of Jewish history. It's the drama of national Jewish life. It's, it's the destiny of the Jews. It's the Jewish people in a larger sense. We come from a very significant tradition. And Uritem al Ha'avnaim refers to the babies, refers to the families, refers to children and parents and parents and children and siblings and grandparents. It refers to the family, the family focus of Jewish life. And to my mind, this is the threefold role, threefold role of a rabbi. The rabbi cares about the families. The rabbi cares about the families of the congregation, gets on the floor, talks to the kids, is able to relate to the kids, deals with relationships, personal relationships. The rabbi's primary responsibility is to you, the membership of the shul. But then in addition to that, the rabbi's responsibility is also to elevate the level of the congregation when it comes to mitzvah observance and to be able to make traditional Jewish life exciting and meaningful and, and challenging and something that all of us, uh, all of you, all of us uh, are interested in following to enhance our own lives. And then the rabbi's role is to connect us to the overall drama of Jewish life, Jewish civilization, uh, Jewish history and Jewish destiny. So you are blessed. Uh, Rabbi Liad was, uh, as I mentioned, an outstanding student of mine for a couple of years. I, I miss him, but I know he's doing great work. I have found him to be, over the years that I have gotten to know him, privileged to get to know him, to be smart, to be learned, wise, kind, passionate, devoted, and creative. You could not have chosen a better rabbi for your congregation. And so today, as we welcome finally, officially, after this crazy, crazy year, as you welcome this extraordinary young dynamic rabbinic couple, I wish you well. I wish you as a congregation well. Cherish your rabbi and Shoshana. Guard them. Take care of them. Appreciate them. And to you, my beloved student, to Liad, to Shoshana. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give you many, many, many incredible, wonderful years uh, to be able to continue your service uh, to this congregation uh, and to the Jewish people. Your shul is blessed to have you. I am blessed to know you. The Jewish people is blessed to have you as one of our up and coming leaders. May you continue to enjoy amazing success for many years to come. Mazel tov. Wow. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Rabbi, for that amazing introduction. And thank you to everybody who spoke today. I just want to start by acknowledging all of those who made today's event possible. I want to thank my rabbis, Rabbi Shakir's touching introduction, for Simon's beautiful bracha for us, for not just me, but for a whole congregation. And of course, Rav Moshe's words of Torah, it's about to be clear to everybody that I'm a student of Rav Moshe, because while we didn't coordinate our speeches beforehand, there's about to be a lot of overlap between what we talked about. So thank you, Rav Moshe, for sharing your Torah with us. Thank you, Jill, for the countless hours of work you put into organizing this event, along with Margie and Barry, the committee members, and for pulling off something we've never done before, for the Zoom gala. Thank you to you guys, our friends and family who are here right now. Your support and love means so much to me and Shoshana. And finally, thank you, Shoshana. Beyond doing an amazing job as an MC, you're a constant source of support, of love, and of strength. And I wouldn't be where I am today without you. Of course, I also want to acknowledge the loss and the hurt I feel as my mom cannot be here with us today to see this milestone. The happiest of moments continue to have a tinge of sadness as I do all that I can to make room for her memory in my life. So I'm thinking of you today, mom. 
Yesterday, we read about the tragic sin of the Miraglim, the sin of the spies, as the Jewish people slandered the land of Israel, dooming them to wander the desert for 40 years, ultimately causing the generation of the spies to die out, and only the next generation would enter the land of Israel. In our Parsha year together, we discussed last week the two different accounts of this episode with the spies. In one account, in Sefer Bamidbar, God commands the spies to be sent to Israel. While later, in Sefer Devarim, it's the Jewish people who request that the spies be sent. Well, right now, I'm not interested in resolving that conflict, that seeming contradiction. contradiction. What is clear is that in the Torah, it's either God or the Jewish people or some mix of both who are responsible for sending the spies. Now, given that, it's surprising that in Sefer Devarim, when Moshe is giving over his account of the spies, Moses says that he was punished personally. And the reason he's not allowed to enter the land of Israel is because of his participation in the sin of the spies. The Torah tells us in Zvarim, Perak Aleph, Pasuk Lamed Zion, Deuteronomy 137, And also the Lord was angry with me, Moses, because of your sin with the spies, saying you too shall not enter the land of Israel. But why is Moshe being punished for the Jewish people's sins? Additionally, we know that the tradition emphasizes, and it seems clear in the Torah, that Moshe was actually punished at May Meriva, at the episode with the water giving rock, where Moshe hit the rock instead of speaking to it. If that's the case, why is Moshe blaming the spies and the episode that follows for his eventual punishment at May Meriva? I think the answer lies and understanding the broader dynamic of Jewish leadership. On the one hand, Moshe Rabbeinu is our model of a melech and a rav, of a king and a rabbi. And he serves as an early example of a halachic idea that we see throughout the Talmud, that rabbinic authority is a reflection in the smallest sense of malchut, of kingly authority. Thus, as an authority figure and as a leader, Moshe Rabbeinu would be expected on some level to exist outside his constituents, as a mentor or an authority figure living above his followers. But on the other hand, Moshe here is revealing a much more complicated truth of Jewish leadership. The rabbi does not exist above his congregants, despite having some amount of halachic authority. Rather, the rabbi and his constituents exist in a symbiotic relationship. The community needs someone to dedicate their time to learning Torah, to pursuing Jewish interests and facilitating Jewish life. But the rabbi, the rabbi ultimately needs a loving and welcoming community full of energetic and passionate constituents, welcoming members to actualize any religious vision he may bring to the table. The rabbi thrives off the passion and energy of the constituents and the constituents are energized and happy with the Torah and the Jewish life that the rabbi brings to the congregation. Ultimately, it is neither the rabbi nor the constituents that are responsible for the congregation's victories or to blame for the failures. Rather, it is the community that the two parties, which is a reflection of the healthy symbiotic relationship between the two parties. Therefore, while it may be true that Moshe did not hit the rock until Neymar Riva, and thus guaranteed that he would not enter the land of Israel, Moshe is correctly identifying the point where his relationship with the Jewish people stopped being symbiotic and healthy. The negativity and pessimism introduced during this early episode in the desert, which Moshe spoke a little bit about, culminating ultimately in the sin of the spies, reverberated from the people to their leader Moshe, and then from Moshe through his relationship with his congregants back to the people, the Jewish nation. Thus, Moshe is singling out the point of breaking, the fracture that existed at this point in the spy episode between him and the Jewish people. While it may not be until May Mariva that Moshe is punished, it all happens because of the events in Parshat Shlach. Indeed, while undoubtedly Moshe Rabbeinu has an essential place in our tradition as Rabbeinu, our rabbi and teacher of Torah, in some ways, we see the difficulty Moshe experienced transitioning from the role of Melech, a king, who unilaterally commands and organizes subjects, to that of rabbi, one who has to convince his congregation 
that they're on the same team and they're partners in the same endeavor. It's not surprising that immediately following the episode of the spies, Korach rises up and rebels against Moshe, as surely he too must have seen the fractures forming in Moshe's relationship with the Jewish people. Further, as Rav Moshe explicated earlier, this also gives a new meaning to the emphasis placed in the Torah and Eldad and Medad, two of the next generation of leaders who are selected to help Moshe. The Torah tells us that unlike Moshe, who famously lived outside of the Jewish encampment, Eldad and Medad prophesied from within the camp. The Torah is emphasizing that the next generation of Jewish leadership, those who have the relationship and skills necessary to lead from within instead of from above, are lined up and ready. Fascinatingly, this rabbinic challenge, having to exist both inside and outside the camp, finds halachic expression in well, as well. In the late 19th century, in an episode which became known as the, known as the Torah verdict of Galenta, the Tzak Din of Galenta, the Jewish community of Galenta had a major crisis when their rabbi died and in his will appointed a future successor that the congregation was not super thrilled about. The issue of whether or not they were forced to accept this rabbi pushed the halachic issue. Where does a rabbi's halachic authority come from? Is he like a melech, a king presiding over the congregation by dint of his natural status? Or is he a misharit, a servant of the community, drawing his authority from the fact that the congregation appointed him, an appointment that was notably lacking in this case? Again, the halacha is sensitive to this dual role the rabbi plays as both a leader and an attendant, balancing the role of authority with his deference and dedication to his community. Given this understanding of the rabbi as a more complicated role than a church father or a religious authority figure, I can honestly say that I feel so blessed and so fortunate to have been invited to join such a welcoming, beautiful, and passionate community as the Stanton Street Show. The relationships I've made with this amazing community have already borne beautiful fruit, as our shul is thriving and growing despite the challenges of the pandemic. Much like the generation of leaders that took over after Moshe, I come to Stanton Street Shul with a keen awareness of the immense and impressive Jewish history that preceded me. Like the Jews about to leave the desert life behind, Stanton Street Shul finds itself in an essential moment of transition on the precipice of actualizing its fullest potential to serve the Jewish people as a thriving node of religious community after a storied hundred plus year of dynamism and change. Indeed, much like the Lower East Side has historically served as an origin and an incubator for American Jewry, providing a preview of the new heights that will be reached, it once again finds itself at an exciting moment in Jewish history. Downtown Jewry is thriving and growing albeit with a slightly different aesthetic and a slightly different vibe from when Moshe Feinstein first came over. Jews of all backgrounds and identities are moving to the historic home of American Judaism. And I am proud to be part of such a beautiful and welcoming community that not only accepts its diversity and multivariegated character, but proudly promotes it. As we say at Stanton, all are welcome, all will feel welcome. Thus, while I started this speech out with some targeted thank yous, I want to conclude it with some notes of appreciation and a bracha for all of us. In addition to all of the amazing volunteers and individuals who made today possible, I want to thank everyone at the Stanton Street Shoal for welcoming me, Shoshana, and recently our newest dog, Pepper, into, with open arms into your community. But sometimes Stanton sells itself short. Beyond merely welcoming, Stanton's true strength lies in the support and ultimately empowerment it provides its members me and Shoshana included. Unlike Moshe in the desert, I'm blessed to have a community that energizes me and gives me the strength, the passion, and the commitment necessary to undertake the daunting task of religious leadership. To conclude, I wanna share that blessing with all of you. While we're just starting our relationship together, I wanna to bless all of us that we should continue to symbiotically thrive off each other serving as a constant source of support and empowerment for each other. If we continue in the beautiful relationship we've developed so far and allow it to thrive, we'll look back and see that today was not merely my installation as a rabbi, but a celebration of our beautiful community together. More specifically, 
Today is a celebration of our community's ability to overcome the challenges of the Jews in the desert and to together create a community that empowers each and every one of its members to lead. Thank you all so much. And I'm excited to see the amazing things that await us together in our future. Thank you. everyone to create Stand in Street's first ever Zoom Hora. Please join us and dance as we close out our unique Zoom evening together. Small and mighty, we are the little shul that could. Let's take great joy in what we are able to achieve as a community together. And thank you so much for the crucial role that each of you play. Thank you for helping to sustain our shul. Your participation means everything. There's Adam Adam. Thank you everyone dancing with us. Hilariously. Hi, Jessica. Marty's like dancing. Love it, Mary. May we all be here together next year and together for real, not make a difference. I want to thank you all for celebrating our Yeah.